There's a story about the Baal Shem Tov, a Chodosh. Two boys grew up in a shtetl. Went to Cheder together, same age. They grew up, they got married. They established families in the shtetl. They were living right across the street from one another. One had a local job, and the other traveled countryside, buying and selling. I'm very close. One of the trips of the one of them, the other calculated and realized that he would return on his birthday. So he decided to make a celebration, plan it for the time he's going to return. He got the friends together, and in this fellow's own home, they set it up. So when he would come in, thinking he was just coming home from a trip, He'll be greeted by a beautiful celebration. Kachava, he comes home, and he sees the people gathered, and then it occurs to him that it's his birthday, celebration. He's very happy. And he walks into the house with a bag of money that he earned on the trip. And seeing all the people and the surprise of the celebration, he took the bag of money and put it down on a bookshelf, and started to circulate among the guests and greet them. His friend from across the street, who organized the whole party, thought to himself, that's very irresponsible. You spend weeks on the road earning money that your family depends upon, and you just put it down on the bookshelf? So when Noah was looking, the friend from across the road took the bag of money, and went out and brought it to his house. His plan was that the friend sooner or later would notice that it was missing and be upset, and then while he was upset, he could tell him that he behaved in an irresponsible manner. But as the Hashkafa would have it, he didn't notice it. <coughs> and it got later and later, till finally the friend across the street said, well, I can't wait around all night, tomorrow morning. I'll go over and I'll, by then, by then he'll surely have noticed that it's missing, and I'll explain to him his mistake. Tomorrow morning comes, he goes to shul, comes back, eats breakfast, and anything. Well, now's the time to confront him. He goes over to the friend's house, and the friend is sitting there with the police chief, reporting the fact that the money was there, and who was at the party, and the fact that it was missing. And now the friend from across the street thinks, this has now gotten complicated because I know what I was trying to do. I know my good intentions, but is the police chief going to believe that? I could get into serious trouble here. So he says, I'm going to go home and think about it. So he goes home, thinks about it, and the more he thinks about it, the more he realizes that he's lost. He's not going to give it back. He can't face that. But what to do? His friend across the street lost a bag of money, and if he's going to turn up with a whole uh, sum of money that was unexpected, it, it would be very difficult to explain. So he decided that he was going to go on a phony business trip, the countryside, and come back in a couple of weeks pretending that he had earned that money, and that was the way he would cover up, cover up the well-intentioned theft. So he made all these provisions, and he told the people he was going out on a trip. He gets in his wagon and starts driving down the road. Some piece down the road, Coming opposite him is the Baal Shem Tov in another wagon. And when the two wagons draw abreast, the Baal Shem Tov reaches over and grabs the reins of the Jew's wagon, stops both of them, and he says to him, go back. I know you meant it for good. Go back, admit it, and if there's a trial, I will come and testify on your behalf that you meant it for good. And at that moment, the Jew made the life-changing decision of turning back. That story has a double message. Number one, there's always hope. No one is really lost. There's always the capacity to change. If a Kodesh Baruch Hu is giving me life now, that means that he believes in me. And if he believes in me, it would be very foolish for me not to believe in myself. 
And the second message is that a Kodesh Baruch Hu is there to help. He doesn't expect you to do it on your own. He hasn't abandoned you. Not only does he believe in you, but he's willing to invest in you to enable you to turn around. We say, and people ask, Shuva is my job. How can I ask a Kodesh Baruch Hu, so to speak, to engineer my Shuva? Shuva is my responsibility. The simplest pshat is the word Shlema. I have to start the process. I have to take the initiation. He makes it shalom. Indeed, I don't have the strength to make the shlema perfect, the tshuva perfect, to make it complete. But I don't have to do that. Because Baruch is the one who will make it complete if I make the first step. And a slightly deeper pshat, a person who says to himself, I'm not perfect, I'm failing. There are areas in which I need to make progress. And he asks the Kodesh Baruch Hu for help, realizing that he can't do it alone, realizing that he's dependent upon the Bari Olam, the Creator, that itself is the initiation. That can be enough of an initiation for Kodesh Baruch Hu to say, yes, I see you want, you've made a gesture, you've made a step, and I will give you the means to be able to complete it. The message here is that a Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't give up. He doesn't give up on us. If we look at the history of the world, the true way where the Torah presents it, we see over and over again times of disaster that a Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't give up on us. Kodesh Baruch Hu created Gan Eden, Adam and Chav and Gan Eden, the perfect free will test, 50-50. Since then it's become much worse. And he had the ability to succeed. Kodesh Baruch Hu gave him, there was a nachash, a temptation, and he should have chosen correctly, and he didn't. What was the result? Well, they were expelled from Gan Eden. The whole world disintegrated. As the Ramchal describes it, the whole world took a qualitative step down. What was Gashmius, physicality, for our Rishon, for us is our spirituality. What was his lower level is the highest we can imagine. His higher level of Ruchnius is beyond our ability to understand. And our level of Gashmius didn't exist. That came into existence. So we are living in an entirely different world. Now let's pick up one detail of the story. When they ate, they realized that they were naked. They made clothes. They made clothes out of leaves. What did the Kodesh Baruch Hu do? He made them clothes out of wool. Big day or with an ayin, which Chazal say means clothing substance that grows out of the body, which is wool. Kodesh Baruch Hu didn't say, you failed, I'm kicking you out, goodbye. No, he said, you failed, you have to leave, but I'll give you the right clothes. Your clothes are inadequate, I'll give you the right clothes. And the you say, that was vote of confidence. Don't think that I'm cutting myself off from you. Don't think that the door is closed. On the contrary, the door is open. I'll clothe you myself. And after they left Gan Eden, the door was open for anyone to recover a connection with Gan Eden. Not exactly the condition of Gan Eden, but a connection, what Avram Avinu did. Everyone could have done that, says the Ramchal. <clears throat> in the Dark Shem, part one. Could have been a world full of Avram Avinu's. Only Avram Avinu did it. That was the time of the establishment of the 70 nations. Avram Avinu created that reality for himself and for his, the nation that came out of him. After that, any other nation or part of any other nation could have detached themselves and attached themselves to Avram Avinu, to Klai Israel, and there would have been only one nation. Not two-tiered humanity, I'm a nifchar, the chosen people and everybody else, but one. Everyone on the same level. No one did it. It came to Matan Torah. The Medrash says, which you all know, that the Kodesh Baruch Hu offered the Torah to all the, world, the nations of the world, not in place of us. Chas v'shalom. Yom Hashishi means the world was hanging in suspense until the sixth, the, 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 the sixth of Sivan, when Klai will accept the Torah. Klai Yisrael accepted the Torah is absolute necessity, but everyone else could have joined us. The whole world could have accepted the Torah, as it could have been the Dor HaMakul. 
בשגם הוא בשר, זה חז"ל, בשגם אז משה, משה רינו סול was in the, in, the, in the generation of the flood, they too could have had the Torah. Kodesh Baruch Hu didn't give up on, on mankind. The door was open and repeatedly a Kodesh Baruch Hu's hand is outstretched to take them back. And after modern Torah, the door of Geras is open. And the ideal resolution would be for all non-Jews to become Jews. That would be the ideal resolution. And there are even a few sheets that say that Bisman Mashiach, we can accept Gerim, because humanity is really Yisrael. Adam and Chava were Yisrael. The degraded element of humanity is a result of the Chait. The Zohar says that in the, in the Eitz Adas, all Tayyik mitzvahs were present. The Kaddish Baruch Hu didn't give up. The door has always been open and is still open. The chance for Mashiach. People have a, an impression that Rabbi Akiva believed that Bar Kofa was a Mashiach. And of course, since it didn't turn out that way, that he made a mistake. That's wrong. That's wrong. The Rambam says in Hilchus Malachim that a person can have what's called Cheskas Mashiach. If he's a certain kind of person, has a certain effect on the people around him, and has plans to rebuild the Beit HaMikdash, he has Cheskas Mashiach. If a person has Cheskas Mashiach, we are mechuyuf, we are obligated to follow him, pledge allegiance to him, and to aid him. That's Cheskas Mashiach. Not everything that has a Chazaka, for those who learn Gemara, turns out to be true. It's just halacha that you have to treat it that way. If it doesn't turn out that way, Rabbi Kiva made no mistake. He treated Bar Kokhba as having Chesras Mashiach. Other Tanayim disagreed with him. And he followed him. When it turned out that he wasn't Mashiach, it turns out that the Chazaka was not fulfilled. Because the Chazaka in a person means the Chodesh Baruch who is opening up the time. He's telling Klai Yisrael, it's roy, it's appropriate, it's ready, it's waiting. If you will follow this person and if you will make, make his plans a reality, it will happen. They didn't, and it didn't. In many places and times, because Rochu sets up a time that's ra'ui, that's appropriate for the Mashiach to be realized. That's why Rishonim, who follow the Gemara, that you're not supposed to calculate the end, did give dates for coming of Mashiach. Isn't that a terrible contradiction? The Gemara says not to do it. They themselves quote the Gemara says not to do it, and then they themselves do it. No, they're calculating times when it's ra'ui, when it's appropriate. When the conditions are set up, it could happen at other times also. This, these, these times are more fortuitous, they're more prepared by Hashgach. It's another symptom of the idea that the Baruch Hu doesn't give up. And if he hasn't given up on us, then it would be tragic if we gave up on ourselves. The Badichev Rebbe, Rebbe Yitzchak Badichev, once came home late at night, across the street there was a blacksmith working, it was quite late. And he saw him working, he saw him by the candle in the workshop. So he went in and said to him, What's keeping you up so late? He was afraid maybe he had some financial problems or other worries. And the blacksmith said to him the words that had become immortal, Rebbe, as long as the candle burns, something can be fixed. As long as the candle burns, something can be fixed. And that's true with the candle of life for each and every one of us. There's a statement that comes to us from the Musa movement that there's no static position. Either you're going up or you're going down. And the parable that's used to illustrate it is, take a fish, which has been out of the water for a while. If you want to know whether the fish is alive or dead, throw it into a moving stream. If it goes upstream, then it's alive. It's swimming against the current. If it goes downstream, it's probably being carried by the current and it's dead. That's the muscle that we have from the Bali Musa. I would like to suggest and another possibility. Suppose you throw the fish into the moving stream and it doesn't go upstream and it doesn't go downstream. Is it alive or dead? It's got to be alive, doesn't it? Because if it were dead, it would be floating downstream. Now that fish is pushing against the flow. It's just not going upstream, but it's pushing against the flow. And that fish is alive. I've asked Bali Musa, what do you mean you have to be going up or going down? Why? Is this supposed to be some deep, mysterious idea? It doesn't seem that way in life. 
people reach a plateau, and in terms of their performance, they have their, their minyanim, and they have their storm of learning, and they go to work, and they give that stalker. And it doesn't seem obvious that they're going up or going down. The answer is that this principle of Musr is not describing your external conduct. It's talking about your inner ruchnius. And your inner ruchnius is either going up or going down. And if you are fighting to stay where you are against the flow of the stream pulling you down, then your ruchnius is going up. As long as you're fighting, your ruchnius is going up. For many years, I came to Elul, I would learn the Rambam's Hilchus Tshuva with the Talmidim. And I would say there is a terrible deception of the Sultan that you go through with Shoshani and Kippur, you have certain problems, you clap al chayt, you promise to do tshuva, and year after year, you look at the list of things that you're saying al chayt for, it's the same list. And you begin to get depressed. So I tried to encourage people, a whole year has gone by, 365 days, roughly. Uh, lots of things change in a person's life. Even if you're 40 or 50, a lot of things change in a year, and you shouldn't give up, and you should say, yes, it is possible that this year will be different. That's true. That's certainly true. But a few years ago, I saw what the Nasiba Shalom writes about it. And he says, if you're still fighting, if you haven't given up, if you're still trying, you're spiritually alive. That itself is a success. That means you're going up because your ruach is active. Your ruach is producing a result that wouldn't be there without the ruach. And that being the case, you're still a success. Here you can feel the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is investing in you, you feel it in the fact that you spiritually still have hopes. You still have regrets. Regrets are very healthy. And you still therefore have plans to look for ways to improve. You may be stationary in the stream, but in Ruchlius, you're going up. It's famous that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put us into the world to be Shutofi Mamei Sabrashis be partners in the process of creation. There are two ways that this could be done. Two ways to prepare the world so that we could really be partners in my celebrations. One is, because Baruch will create the world and just not finish it. Leave it unfinished. And then say, you are my partners, you have to contribute so the world will become finished. That's not the way it is. The other alternative, which is the true alternative, is that the Baruch Hu created the world complete, perfect, and then broke it. He broke it stage by stage until finally it shattered. It shattered into shards, broken pieces, scattered, and then he gathered up combinations of those broken pieces and created a new world into which he inserted us. This is what the Medrash is talking about when it says, Bore Olamas Umachrivan. He created a world and he destroyed them. That has nothing to do with dinosaurs. Nothing. It has nothing to do with billions of years. Nothing. <coughs> this is a ruchniistic reality. It's what's called in those foreign Shvira Sakeli, the breaking of the vessels. So Kodesh Baruch Hu gave us a history that looks like a U. He started the history at the top with a perfect creation. <coughs> and then it deteriorated and deteriorated and deteriorated. At a certain point, there was an actual breaking, shattering, and the pieces fell. And then he partially reconstructed it. So we're coming up the other side of the U. And at that point, he inserted us. And the reason he did it that way is because Ein Chadash, not only Tachas Hashem, there's nothing new. You can't create something that wasn't there before. You can only recreate what HaKadosh Baruch Hu prepared. So he prepared the other elevation of the U, that side of the U, and he prepared also the pit above which we were created so that our actions could take us up or down because both of them were recreated. This is just like the famous Chazal, that before birth, the fetus is taught all the Torah in the womb and then forgets it. What good is it if you're taught it and you forget it? The answer is that when you come into the world and learn Torah, it's second time, not first time. It couldn't be first time. 
There's no way that a boss of Adam, a, a flesh and blood person, can learn Torah Ben Shemayim. It's two categories. It's oil and water. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, Chazal say, standing at High Sinai and hearing from a Kaddish Baruch Hu, Bechvot of Atzmo, hearing from a Kaddish Baruch Hu, he couldn't remember. Kaddish Baruch Hu taught him and he forgot it. He taught him and he forgot it. Until the Kaddish Baruch Hu did a special nace, then he should be able to remember it. Because the incompatibility, the incommensurability between the Kaddish Baruch Hu's Torah, that's his reality, and our reality is so great, there can't be any connection unless there's a special preparation, a special injection that comes only from his side. Same thing is true with the world as a whole. What we are trying to do is recover that shalim condition, that perfect condition that Akash Baruch Hu gave the world. Only this time it will come to, to existence through us rather than just coming down min HaShemayim. One of the great illustrations of how Akash Baruch Hu has his hand open and is working always for the rehabilitation of the world is Mamed HaSinai. Chazal tell us that, uh, according to one Tana, Kodesh Baruch Hu said to Klai Yisrael, I want three days of preparation and I'm going to give the Torah on the third day. Moshe Benner said, no, let's make it on the fourth day. Hosif Yom Echad And Kodesh Baruch Hu agreed with him and, te- and, and the Torah was given on the fourth day. Let's take that position and work it out. So the Torah is one day later than the Kodesh Baruch Hu originally planned. What day of the week was the Torah given on? Shabbat, correct. When it says, Kudi Alma Modi, the Shabbos Nitna Torah. Torah was given on Shabbos. So if that's one day later than the Kodesh Baruch Hu planned, he was planning to give it on Friday. And the Pesach says, Ani Amarti Elokimat, Elokimatem, I said, you are like angels, immortal. So let's put two and two together. Kodesh Baruch Hu created Adam on Friday, and he was immortal, wasn't he? And he wanted to give the Torah on Friday, and he made us immortal. This, says the Shevi Shmuel, is a replay of Gan Eden. Another chance, a chance to do it right. A chance to make it a success. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu say that he didn't want it? Because Moshe Rabbeinu said, what happened the first time? When they failed, you kicked them out. When they failed, your relationship to them changed drastically. Their condition and their challenge was lost. I don't want that to happen again. I want insurance. The difference between Friday and Shabbos is this. A weekday, we are active, we are creative, and any bris, any covenant that's made on a weekday is a bris that comes from two sides, and from us, and has the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. And since there's an essential human component, it's fragile. It's not necessarily permanent and, inv- and invulnerable. It's, it's fragile. Moshe Benes said to Kodesh Baruch Hu, no, do it on Shabbos. Shabbos is kviyah v'kaimah. Shabbos is absolutely established. It comes from you. We are not creative. Shabbos means, the word Shabbos means, I won't take you through the exercise of all the mistaken understandings of it, the word Shabbos means cessation. Lishbos means to stop doing something. In particular, in halacha, it means to be stop being physically creative. The whole of the Ruchdias of Shabbos comes from a Kodesh Baruch Hu. The Ruchdias, the Gashmi, the whole of the world comes from, from a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And that being the case, a bris made on Shabbos can't be, it can't be broken. Even if we fail, it can't be broken. The bris remains. That's why with the, with the Hegel Zohar, with the golden calf, even though we fail, the bris remains. The bris is eternal. Can't be, cannot, cannot be undone. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu accomplished. But you see that with the failure of Gan Eden, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has the door open for a replay that it should be successful. We have to understand, we say in the Sof Ma'aseh B'Machshav Atchila, the last step in action is the first step in thought. That's a philosophical category. It's a very important insight. A person sets out to accomplish something. How does his thought process work? I want to become a doctor. Okay, so I'll have to get into medical school. How am I going to get into medical school? I'll go to a good undergraduate school that has a good pre-med program, 
I'll work hard, I'll do extracurricular subjects, fine. How am I going to get into that undergraduate program? Well, if I'm in high school now, I better do good in science, I better do extracurricular medical type of activities, I better get good recommendations. That's the, that's the thought process. From medical school to graduate school, from, yeah, from being a doctor to, to, grad, to medical school to undergraduate school to a good high school record. Now, how does the action start? It starts now when I'm in high school and goes step by step back up the same ladder from end to beginning. Sov Masa, what's end in action, which is becoming a doctor, is Machshava Tchila, in thought is first. This is not just chronology, it's not just a question of when, what happens. But it means that the end thought is what guides the whole process. Every step of the way, the thought is, I'm going to become a doctor. Same thing true with the Kodesh Baruch. The Kodesh Baruch Hu's end thought is Olam Abba. And everything that's being done is worked back from the idea of Olam Habo. When I talked about the Kodesh Baruch Hu creating a perfect world and the world's deteriorating and disintegrating, those worlds are worlds of machshava. They're worlds of thought. This is the Ramchal's Torah. They're worlds of thought. The first thought is Olam Habo for, for, for humanity. Olam Habo for humanity. That thought is perfect. That thought has no cracks. No losses. Everything is worked back as a means to get to that thought. As you work down and work down and work down to the point where you have to create a world with evil in it so that there will be real bechirat, real free choice. That's a means, but that even the existence of the evil is guided by that final thought that it's going to Gan Eden. Because it's that final thought that's guiding the whole process, of course the door is always open. Kodesh Baruch Hu's plans don't fail. Because Baruch Hu's plans don't fail. Therefore, the door is always open for the cloud and for the yochid. And the person has the opportunity always to be able to rehabilitate himself. Some may be aware of sources that sound like some things get lost entirely. There are such shitas. There are such shitas. Ramachal's shita is not that way, although he contradicts himself in, various, in certain places. But it seems like his final shita is that nothing ever gets lost. Nothing ever gets lost. The Ramban seems to say the same thing. Every year, almost every year, uh, at this time of the year, some <clears throat> self-styled scholar, an expert, writes an article, and it's published in all the non-from Jewish publications, that mourning for the destruction of Yerushalayim is out of date. Have you been there recently? Look at the construction. Look at the population. Look at the football stadiums and the art galleries and the concert halls and the, the string bridge over the entrance of Yerushalayim. How can you say that it's destroyed? How can you mourn its destruction? Indeed, this year, one went so far as to say to mourn for the destruction of Yerushalayim is a slap in the face of God. No less. He has a special pipeline to God. He knows exactly what God is feeling. And uh, he could tell us that that's what God is worried about. He's worried about our wounding for the destruction of Yerushalayim. <clears throat> the bracha that we say on weekdays for the rebuilding of Yerushalayim has a very interesting structure. For the Yerushalayim, Erechop Rachmin Toshu, Sishko Besocha Kasher Dibarta, Uvnei Aisa. There are three steps. And the last one is the Kisei of David Amelech. The first two steps are the return of the Shekhinah to Yerushalayim. The third step is a physical rebuilding. I think the message is obvious. We are not looking at the number of cubic feet of enclosed space inside solid walls. That's not the rebuilding of Yerushalayim. I'll give you an analogy. The goal of the Muslim world is to conquer the world. No non-Muslim state is legitimate. The United States of America is an illegitimate state. Now let's say they get their way. They conquer the United States, a lot of destruction. And then the question becomes how to rebuild. And they decide Washington was a beautiful city with great buildings. We're going to rebuild it the same, brick for brick. We have extensive photographs. We have architect's plans. The Capitol building, uh, the, the Congress, the White House, all be built brick for brick. 
The, the Capitol building will be the world's largest library of Sharia law. And the White House will be a gigantic mosque, and so forth and so on. Now imagine a few years after the rebuilding, an American patriot from Iowa travels to Washington to see the city. Will he rejoice at the rebuilding of Washington? I don't think so. Because those buildings that he associates with a culture and politics of freedom is now housing an obscenely criminal culture. He can't rejoice in the rebuilding because there are lots of bricks and lots of plastic and lots of fluorescent lighting. People who write articles like that just demonstrate how out of touch they are with the reality that the Torah is dealing with. What has kept us alive for 3,300 years is not continuous architectural skills and the dedication to put tar on the, on the, on the ground so that wheels will travel better. That is not what has kept us alive for 3,000 years. And as long as they are distracted that way, they make it worse. They make it much harder to take the steps forward that we have to take. And I think, here I'm speaking on my own, but it seems to me that in the last 100 years or so, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has been giving us open investments. We are in Ikvis of the Mashiach, the footsteps of the Mashiach, that language has been in our sforum for the last 150, 200 years, coming close to the end of the 6,000 year limit. I think the Kodesh Baruch Hu is showing us signs that he's participating in the progress. And I mean this to have no connection, as you'll see, to any political movement. But these are undeniable facts. Um, the fact that the land of Israel has become open, freely, for a Jew to go there without any obstacles. Until 1948, that was impossible. Any Jew who came here was risking danger and uh, risking political entities which could conquer and could, uh, could destroy. The fact that any Jew who wants to come to Eretz Israel could come to Eretz Israel is a gigantic gift that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Kali Israel. Not commenting on how that's engineered and what the politics are behind it, but the fact. The fact is that we have that opportunity. And even those who are the most ardent in rejecting the state have institutions here, yeshivas and chadorim and housing projects and all the rest, because living in Eretz Israel is something which is, 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 is ideal for every Jew. And when it becomes easy, it becomes something a matter of choice, it's something to celebrate. The recovery of Rishonim, the Rishonim that were lost for hundreds of years and have been recovered in the last hundred years. The Toysavis Harash. Who learns a Toysavis today without looking at the Toysavis Harash? I had the great privilege to learn with Sikh Shalevsky. And we had a difficult Toysavis. And we would look at the Maharshal. And the Maharshal would struggle with it. We looked at the Toysavis Harash. And Rav Tzvi said, if the Maharshal had had the Toysavis Harash, he would not have written what he wrote. Because very often the Taisus Arash shows you what the Taisus meant. And the Me'iri, whether you follow the Chazanish, the Paschal like the Me'iri, the Paschal like the Me'iri, but everyone learns the Me'iri. The Mishnah Brura quotes the Me'iri. And the, the Ma'aral, of Desta writes, when they recovered the Ma'aral's Chidushi Agolos, he writes to someone, tell me how they know it's genuine and get me a copy. Every Yishi, every every Bar Mitzvah Bochur gets a copy of the Chiddush Agadah of the, of the Maharal. You don't have a library without the Chiddush. You don't learn Agadah without the Maharal. Many, many Rishonim who were lost for hundreds of years became recovered and came back to Klausra. There's a revival of the language. No matter who did it and what Schmutz was in his mind and what failures were in his mind, but B'Sofor Shel Davar, people are speaking Hebrew. And many people who speak Hebrew the literature is open to them. I saw an incident here in Rosameh, on the third floor, when we had an Israeli-based medrash. It was Mincha time. And there was a, a boy there, and he had a rov on one side and a rov on the other side. One rov put a yarmulke on his head, and the other put a, a sitter in his hand, and they pushed him into Dab Mincha. He could do that because Hebrew is his native language. He could read the words and understand them. He can't do that with an American. He'll call the police. What do you mean? How can you possibly? forced me into a religious performance. 
So the recovery of living in Eretz Israel and the Rishonim, I think we can feel that the Kodesh Baruch Hu is giving us support. He's pulling aside the veil a little bit so that we should be able to see that there is, there is a, a power behind the scenes that's working in our favor. I also think when historians will write this period of history, the last 60, 70 years, a great puzzle uh, will be very difficult to solve. Uh, there are, there always have been tens of millions of Arabs surrounding us, and now there are even more, 70 million in Egypt alone. And although they disagree on their politics, and they disagree because some of them have oil, some don't have oil, and they disagree whether they're Shiites or Sunnis, there's one thing they all agree on, and that is Israel shouldn't exist. Why didn't they ever all get together and make a concerted effort to wipe Israel off the map? That has never happened. Never. Why not? I don't think you can explain it other than Ashkacha is dividing them and making it impossible for them to put into practice what they all believe in. So I think we have to be sensitive to this and thankful for this. And we have to say, we see that Kodesh Baruch Hu is still pushing, still beckoning, still reaching out with a hand that we, could, that we could take. And if we take the hand, then he will make it, he'll make it complete. Um, one last thought that I want to share with you. You can divide mitzvahs into two types. There are mitzvahs where every piece of the mitzvah is absolutely necessary. You wear tefillin, one os, one letter that isn't perfect, and the tefillin are puzzled. Period. I have a meaning. Three out of four doesn't do it. You have to have all four. If you have three, you can wave them all day. You've done absolutely nothing. Other mitzvahs aren't like that. Um, Tzlokho. There are rules of giving charity. There's a certain amount that every person should give. Let's suppose a person doesn't live up to the challenge and doesn't give all the charity that he should give. But he gives half. That half is mitzvah. He will get reward for that half. It isn't an all or nothing proposition. Talmud Torah, there are rules for when you should study, how much you should study, what counts as a, as a, a legitimate way of stopping and not stopping. But a person who doesn't do it perfectly, every word, says the Gura, every word of Talmud Torah, is another mitzvah. What about tshuva? Is tshuva like tefillin? Or is tshuva like tzedakah in Talmud Torah? Tshuva has three parts. One has to regret the past, resolve to change the future, and say vidui, to confess. What about doing only part of one of them? Shall I change the future? Sure, on Tuesdays. Tuesdays are going to be good. I'm, I'm, we're going to work hard to make Tuesdays good. Every day, I can't handle it. I just can't handle it. And let's say, it might be true, it might not be true, but that's his attitude. So do Tuesdays count? Yes, they count. They count. Regret counts, even without resolve to change the future. I, you'll tell me what the Gemara says, and the Rambam quotes it, someone who says vidui and doesn't intend to change, is like a toivo v'sheretz v'yodos, like a person who's going to mikveh with a sheretz in his hand, the dead sheretz has metami him. While he's underwater, the dead sheretz is making him tummy. You read that and you think that's a picture of futility. But one of them, the Mephoshim and the Rambam, asks, are we talking about an insane person? He's going to mikvah because he knows he's tummy and he wants to become tar. He's holding the dead sheretz and bringing it into the mikvah with him. So what is he, insane? No, he wants to be tar. He wants to be tar. He wants to purify himself. He just can't let go of the sheretz. He can't let go of it. But he wants to be tar. That's not nothing. That's not nothing. The Me'iri in the Hebrew of Tshuva says, when, Baruch, when the Amalek confronts Bilam on his way to curse the Jewish people, and uh, Bilam, full of hatred and full of desire to curse the Jewish people, says to the Amalek, Chatosi, I'm guilty, shall I go back? And the, the, the Me'iri says, that's not a sincere Tshuva, but he knows the right word to say. He knows that's the word that one says when one's in this position. That's not zero, and the proof of it is, he got the permission to continue on his, on his, on his, on his uh, uh, journey. 
Tshuva comes in pieces, and it's not an all or nothing proposition. And that being the case, any step forward, any gesture, any effort is something which has a kiyum in it and deserves a schar and certainly will generate a mida kedeket mida, a response for Kodesh Baruch Hu. You te- took a step forward, I'm going to give you an, an ability to take another step forward. If we appreciate the fact that Kodesh Baruch Hu is keeping our candle burning and giving us the ability to breathe, to breathe, to walk, to think, to learn, and what he's doing for Klai Yisrael in general, with all of the tragedies, with all of the things that Klai Yisrael is suffering, but the positive things which aren't natural, they aren't obvious. The Tshuva movement has no reasonable explanation. People will tell you that it was the 67 war that ignited the, the, the Tshuva movement. Well, what about the 48 independence of the state? That didn't do it? That was less spectacular? Excuse me. No, it does, and it's all over the world. In Russia, and uh, America, and, and England, and even South Africa. And it's pretty strong in South Africa, even in Australia. <laughs> Everywhere. We've had people here from New Zealand. Uh, the ends of the earth. Um, there's no rational explanation for it. It's unique, at least in the last 2,000 years, for, for which we have, of course, we have a detailed history. Uh, we have to see that Kodesh Baruch Hu is surrounding us with ahava, with love, and with help, with support. If we will just take the end of the rope and hold on, Kodesh Baruch Hu will enable us to do the tshuva that we need to do, the yachid and the cloud, and it will help us see the Yeshua that we're davening for.